Good day, everyone. Uh, it's David. So, unfortunately, the plan was for me to be in class today for the first time since uh, COVID hit, but didn't quite happen or didn't work out that way. So, two years of avoiding COVID, and now it actually is um, is here in my household. Anyway, long story short, uh, the d idea today, as with all the previous lectures, was really just to give you a bit of a, a picture and an understanding of where antennas can be used. Now, I know that um, in class you will get a lot of exposure or, uh, with theory, with maths, and you don't necessarily think this is relevant to what you use outside. Uh, I've been a, an antenna engineer now for 25 years, been using antennas in a whole range of applications, and that's the idea of this presentation today, is just show you where it can be used. What I'm also going to do is this is the same presentation, the physical slideshow, because it's always the, the, the same examples. Um, what I'm going to do is, is go through actual examples, applications, just so you can get your, an appreciation for what's going on. And then also after that, there's a bit of a design example. I'm not going into detail, so don't stress about the um, intensity of, of this lecture. This is a fun guest lecture. It's supposed to be in person, so that I can actually do an actual demonstration of a practical product as well. Unfortunately, because I'm not there, I will have to refer to a YouTube video, which I am going to introduce, introduce into this actual session. Um, it has to do with a modification for this and can be used on Wi-Fi and all sorts of other applications. But before I go too much into detail, one thing that I have to note is the change of plan for the lecture came about only 48 hours ago. So my video is not going to be the highest professional quality that I endeavor for our YouTube channel. This is me at my home on my couch and the software and stuff that I'm using is not ideal. So you'll see the PowerPoint presentation. It's not the full-blown presentation. It's the actual PowerPoint file. I'm sure it's going to serve the purpose that it's meant to do, which is the content on the images on there. And then I'll just, with my kind of explanation, tell you where this is about. So let's get into it. Uh, let's go this, this. I'm just going to clumsily go on. There, there we go. <laughs> that's working. All right, so, well, introduction, art of antenna. So it's the same topic for the last two years. It, basically, that's what it is, but I already told you what the video is going to be all about. Um, so through my slides, introduction, who am I? Only five, five, 20 seconds, basically, five, whatever. Um, my name is David, obviously. Um, we look at wireless applications, parameters to remember, and then I'll give you some examples. Who am I? Well, I'm David Dehai, so managing director, and I call myself a principal antenna engineer. It's just kind of all fancy names for me, loving what I'm doing, and I'm running a business, and currently we have 10 people working for us, so I'm actually quite privileged that we managed to employ a um, fair number of people to help me and us as a team collectively get our customers better radio performance, antennas and cables and so forth. Um, been in Adelaide for 12 years, before that worked for Dell Computers in Ireland and of course before that as you can probably hear by now, was born and raised and educated in South Africa at the University of Pretoria. Um, Blackguard Technologies is a, a consulting company that we are now um, running and do antenna designs. Pretty much exactly what you're studying, that's what we're doing and we're loving it. Um, why are antennas important? So this was basically some extracts. So have a look at those links. Antennas were in, are super important because you may be one of the engineers. Most of you will be one of the engineers that basically will have a, a love for the um, software or STR, the software defined radio on a certain box here. There is a connection from a software defined radio or any radio for that matter through to a cable to an antenna and the antenna needs to transfer whatever is being done in this box out to the op open world. This applies to anything like cell phones and everything. There's actual software. Software needs to be translated to the radio wave. The radio wave needs to find its way out to the open. And on the other side, the same needs to happen as well, that you need to have a receiver that's able to actually receive the radio wave bring it in so that the other radio or software can actually decipher what's going on. So you have two software engineers really knowing how to talk to each other, but you have this wonderful path in between of 
technology, physics that is required and it needs to be done properly so you can get the best connection. If you don't have a good connection, I don't care how much signal processing somebody could do. And this is a continuous debate I have with a lot of high-end profile experts saying, well, we can fix everything with our software. No, you can't. If there's no radio connection, you can't do anything about it. That's where I'm at. There's lots of fun. Um, now, go to the examples. It's fairly simple for me, actually. Um, wireless applications. The most obvious one is mobile phones. Um, now, when I did this lecture for the first time 12 years ago, think about it. You, Many of you would have been 10, maybe younger than that. Um, so you grew up knowing mobile phones exist. Now, I am turning 45 this year. So yes, that feels ancient probably for many of you. Um, but when I was in high school, there were no mobile phones. So you basically saw a lot of the evolution of these phones. So of course, the, um, the biggest ones on the left, that was really the initial hardcore um, phones. And then they tend to get smaller and smaller and smaller as we went through the, um, the ages. So I guess they're in the middle. That's roughly what I can remember about the um, early 2000s. And then when Apple iPhone came along, I think 2006, 2007, um, they actually started to get bigger again. And currently the phones that you put against your phone, your head is pretty big actually, but it's a significantly powerful computer. But that's not the point. The point is that there's so many antennas in your phone, it's not even funny. You have so many different frequency bands in your cellular network. Each of those frequency bands need a dedicated antenna or aspect of the antenna to work well. If you are in rural Australia, in the middle of nowhere, there's a certain frequency that gets used more. If you're in the middle of Adelaide, in the middle of Sydney or Melbourne for that, that matter, um, you're going to use a much higher frequency. Now we have 5G, that is a very relevant feature on mobile phones. 5G is another frequency again. Your phone needs to be able to handle all those. And it's not just the software engineers that actually are worried about what's going on and you need to support 2G, 3G, 4G and now 5G plus Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E. You need to support Bluetooth. Each of those technologies have a different frequency and GPS as well. Uh, GPS is not just GPS, it's GPS plus GLONASS and whatever all systems are. All these functions have little antennas. All those little antennas need to fit into those phones that I have show on the screen. It's incredible. So the older phones, I say that there's one on the screen, Nokia 2146, which is the second from the left. You still have an external antenna. That was the antenna. That was one application, one connection from a phone through to the end user. It was quite simple kind of before my time even. Um, but that antenna was probably a proper antenna, relatively proper, not a great antenna, but it's a relatively proper antenna for the application. Now there's so much more in there and it's all antenna technology. So yes, the software gets way more complicated. I appreciate that. But if you ignore the complexity of the antennas, these phones would not have worked right now. Um, and then what's a bit of a fun fact is if you look there, the um, Samsung that I have on the external of that, it shows you we, we try to hide the, the antennas more and more and more inside the phones. But in doing so, we're actually compromising the performance. Um, so we're back to square one. We're trying to put external antennas again. So we get better antennas on the phone so we can get better reach. It's ironic. That's what our offshore pretty much does a lot is helping people to get better connections. In doing that, we actually give them external antennas again. So let's not see the antenna, but let's make it work well. Let's put an external antenna on. It does my head in, doesn't it? The logic isn't there, but that's because antennas are so important. Um, now, 12 years ago, this was a really relevant topic. Between mobile broadband and mobile phones, there was kind of a bit of a distinction. But as you can imagine, as time went on, mobile phones, mobile broadband, internet, it's all one device these days. And that's certainly something over the last five years that we would have seen got more and more um, just muddled up. So you know it's a phone, but how many of you still use a classic phone when you call somebody? When I mean, you have WhatsApp, you have um, FaceTime, you have Facebook, you have um, Skype, you have you know, all the apps, newer apps, they all work, but they all work on data. So it's the, the same concept, but basically just the, uh, the it's not about the technology. I'm going to just tell you the antennas cannot be um, underestimated. 
Um, now, I did mention, and this is probably the most relevant one for us as a business and here in Australia in general, not as a, I mean, a student, you're on campus, everything is always good, although you may complain there is no 5G connection, that's um, anything to get excited about. I appreciate that. But for real life applications, there's a lot of people in rural Australia, and if you think about it, literally, I'm recording this from the south of Adelaide, so further down south is McLaren Vale. You have the York Peninsula, the Air Peninsula, and then anywhere in Australia where you don't have the metropolitan sites, um, they will have to use remote internet. Mobile broadband is, of course, a big thing. I'll, I'll mention Starlink a bit later because that's obviously also, again, antenna theory is, is significant there. When I get to the satellite sl slide, I will talk about that. Um, Mobile broadband is you have a base station at a point, 10, 20, 30 kilometers away, that's the farmhouse or you want to get an internet or a connection between you and the mobile station. Only way to get that done properly is through an antenna. Now, a good antenna connects to a modem or a good antenna connects to a, a repeater or booster product that gets you connection. Without the antenna, that connection won't work. So it really is that long distance connection is, is, is um only achieved by antennas, both on the Telstra, Optus or Vodafone side and on your side. So both ends of the spectrum needs to have good connection antennas. Imagine that Optus just says, well, here's a little, um, little stick of an antenna, put it on my big tower, hopefully we get something. You rely on them having decent budget with a decent antenna, and then you on your end of the uh, same connection need to have a, a good antenna as well. And then when you have two good systems talking to each other, you'll be good. Um, now, connected life, it's all muddled up these days because really connected life is everything. But there's a few examples of what you could do that people go a holiday. Um, we, of course, with the COVID period, had a lot of people working from home. We have a lot of people who are working in a caravan traveling Australia. The only way to be connected is through wireless connections. Wireless connections equals antennas. Uh, that's really all I could say about that. <laughs> And then entertainment, man, this is probably a big one. It's funny because, of course, free-to-air TV, the way we used to know it, I don't know, it dawns on me that I'm talking to 20-something-year-olds here. Why um, Free-to-air TV used to be where you actually have a TV antenna on the roof and you connect to Mount Lofty here in Adelaide. <laughs> it's ironic to say it like that, but I guess we're so used to streaming television these days. We've all got Netflix and Stan and Disney and Paramount and Amazon Prime and all those features. It comes to the data connection, the internet connection, but just imagine you are talking about um, FM radios, you talk about the um, t TV broadcast, the free-to-air TV with the antennas on the roof. They connect to Mount Lofty and you have that radio connection. The radio or TV connection, radio I mean actually just the um, radio wave itself. Um, that's what gets used. And then, of course, satellite TV. Um, satellite TV is relevant for Foxtel and also a lot of the um, traveling community when they go on their motorhomes and so forth. They go out and there's VAS and all sorts of um, satellite TV systems out there. Streaming, again, does fall into the data connection I mentioned right from the start. So it's almost like everything is going into data, which still supports and even more so enhances or increases the demand for proper antenna design. Um, now, this one is really, really critical. It's, it's basically your emergency services. And I have all those pictures on the screen. This, it goes from ambulance through to, um, uh, well, where it goes, it's, uh, fire services, uh, country, um, CFS, CFS. Uh, the photo in the middle is at Uluru. So there's also, even in the national parks, there would be some basic radio coverage so that wherever you are, you can have a, a park ranger come and help you, or do you want the police to be connected? They they are traveling around. You don't know where he is now, where he's going later. We had the helicopter flying over um, now the sun, sun suburbs yesterday, the whole day. The only way a helicopter could communicate to the people on the ground is through wireless connections. Again, comes through proper antenna design. And he's constantly moving, so there's a lot of stuff happening. It's not in this situation where you can say, there's my antenna, good, I'm facing you. Helicopter keeps moving around and goes all around the place. So you need to actually have some understanding of the physics of what do I need 
not just an antenna that's just connected bang it's an antenna that's connected no matter where I am how high I fly what my orientation is if I fly north south east or west all those things um, now of course navigation um, again COVID put through a bit of a wobble so <laughs> I would almost say two or three years ago we used to go on aeroplanes um, a few of us would be flying in the next month or two again um, personally thinking here yeah. uh, the amount of wireless connections hence uh, proper antenna designs that is required is incredible for an aeroplane to fly to um, land safely first of all the kind of GPS and communication systems just to know where this thing is is super important I do remember when they um, when they lost Malaysian Airlines it's for the first time I realized they're not really in real time tracking where an aeroplane is um, and it's quite daunting to think that and that's obviously this kind of stuff that gets improved all the time um, so when an aeroplane is flying you want to know where it is and he wants to stay in little constant radio communication so that he could tell the, the tower and the system where what's going on in the health of the aeroplane um, but then even more important is when you land there's two things that is really important the one is you need to align yourself through then there's a cross at the bottom you need to align yourself so that you know this is my runway I'm coming in straight then also with your actual elevation or the pitch that you're coming in you need to know I am coming too shallow too um, to high and those antennas you will see there's the orange one you see on the left on the screen they are at the end of the runway if you go around Adelaide Airport you'll see those those um, antennas on the runway that's needed for the aeroplane to come in in a straight line and then you always has the has have those towers on the side where you could actually see um, the um, antennas three in a row they have uh, antenna principles that basically um, tells the uh, three at the top plus mirror image three at the bottom it looks like that and there's mirror image theory which you can learn when you go deeper into antenna studies as well that those principles are used so that you can actually have elevation information so that the aeroplane as it comes in it knows the slope that is coming in the glide slope to come into the airport it comes into the very fundamental antenna design plus then some signal processing behind it of course a signal processing guy as I mentioned earlier would probably see it the other way around they do a lot of signal processing they just add on an antenna we say you have an antenna and just add on some signal processing it's all just a bit of um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a bit of um, perspective perspective or perception um, now one important one and this is maybe you see them around quite a lot um, just little dishes around things so they're not small but when they are up on a tower that's 30 meter high or 40 meters high it starts to look really small um, but those dishes basically would be microwave links from point to point and they would have actually have a quite a significant um, pipe between the two sites often gets used as a backup system so you might may have um, fiber connections from A to B but in having a fiber connection from A to B if something happens to the fiber connection you need to have a backup system vice versa as well and this, um, this specific example is relevant for instance when you have uh, electricity utility supplier you want to know what's going on between site A and site B have a fiber connection as is often the case that is good but things happen people dig a hole and they may break the cable there might actually be something that just gets broken then you have a wireless connection from A to B so flip side happens as well you may have a rainstorm of course rainstorms and wind and weather would actually um, cause trouble on your your wireless connections then the fiber will help those two in super critical systems actually help each other and that antenna design the uh, dish on one end and a dish on the other end again high performance dishes need to be done properly so that the system designers know what they do and what they can expect from the antennas they have on there now last one is um, just radar uh, there's many examples of radar out there but um, radar is of course used in defense uh, we currently see the war in Europe happening and just shows you again how important it is to have knowledge of what's going on out there so you can respond and plan accordingly um, the nicer way to do it is of course just air travel and I had the aeroplane at the beginning so in that slide I basically thought about it from the perspective of the aeroplane but also on ground level they want to see what's going on and they have these radars and these radars of course with um, pretty high-end antennas 
will um, will keep an eye out for all the airplanes and then they can tell the airplanes you need to do this you need to do that so forth um, that's basically radar so radar is, is another huge antenna application how that actually works is the radar sends a signal out and it looks for whatever comes back gets reflected back there's a lot of signal processing in that so a lot of respect for the um, signal processing that happens in radar applications um, it's definitely a science on its own um, and it's highly respected but antenna design is crucial in making that work well because if your antenna doesn't perform the way you think it should the radar doesn't work the way you want it to work and you may not know it because if, if you think an antenna is radiating forward towards the screen but it's actually a, a slight mistake in the design and it actually faces this way there's no way you would know that and everything would be offset by that amount so antenna design gets really critical um, one thing that that's been coming up a few times and I actually used to work for a company in Adelaide here uh, code of wireless and they do vehicle to vehicle communication vehicle to vehicle is um, nice because you have two vehicles talking to each other so if they say well hang on we're going to crash the computer in the vehicle could actually determine I need to do something about this think about the autonomous the autonomous vehicles that Tesla is working on this is a significant part of what's happening there is the vehicle has to see and be aware of its surroundings a lot of the um, these things are done by radio of course there's also optics involved but optics is basically the same principles at a much much higher frequency but the principles is often very similar between optics and uh, RF radio frequency um, the, the big thing though is vehicle to infrastructure and this is where the vehicles would actually have knowledge of where it is uh, we know there's a traffic light and there's an if issue with the traffic light it says now wait, listen this is red you need to stop then the vehicle knows but well, I'm approaching a red traffic light I need to stop and if the driver is not making an attempt to stop there's an opportunity to intervene in some way or form that's how it works if it gets used or not that's not for me to decide or to comment on but that's the principle how it would work now this is the big one and of course in Adelaide there's a huge push for the space industry uh, currently the hot topic for every consumers mind is Starlink um, we have tested Starlink and played with it it is an awesome technology but it's all about antenna design of course the um, whatever system not just Starlink or anything but anything else um, just as, a, as an interesting fact I don't know if you know this but the Australian Space Agency is located in Adelaide so it's it's really a significant hot topic you would have these satellites um, not even that high um, L leo uh, low earth orbit um, satellites they do i think it's about every 90 minutes they they um, go around the uh, revolution is around the earth and as they go over there's obviously communication to various devices and base stations and so forth that is super super critical to get good antenna design because you are 500 kilometers away when you are at the top above so you need a radio link between us here on earth and the satellite 500 kilometers away however if this thing is on the horizon it gets worse because then it would be in the order of 2000 kilometers so you need a radio link from here to something that goes over the horizon 2000 kilometers away actually is very far good antenna design is critical on the satellite side and on your side here on ground to actually make it work well that's why these dishes that um, Starlink created that actually tracks these um, these satellites as they fly over us which is continuous uh, is phenomenal because they use something called a phased array and all sorts of technologies in there the, the, the physical dish of Starlink does not move it's a flat surface that just stays there and then of course with all the little antennas in there it uses beam forming and actually um, tracks the satellites and keeps the communication going it's incredible technology um, I have done a few videos on that as well so feel free to watch our YouTube channel and see what I had to say about Starlink um, it's beautiful now uh, you learn a lot about antennas in this course and you may not always feel it is worth it for you and I appreciate that might be a difficult one to to kind of digest at times I was just going to highlight the few things that's really important for me as an antenna engineer and try to remember these when you actually um, go out there if you're an antenna engineer you will use these. if you are just um, referring to antennas as part of your overall systems or you apply it in some other way these are the little buzzwords you need to remember and when a, somebody who claims to be um, 
you know, an expert in internal design, quiz them on these, these, these concepts and see what you learn. Um, it's, it's useful. So I'll just quickly go through them. Um, just a very high level, very basic. Um, do you have gain? Internal gain has to do with, um, well, first of all, efficiency, but the first two go hand in hand, gain and radiation patterns. So antenna gain, I did a video on this as well. An antenna does not gain power, it's a passive device. So an antenna is just like a balloon. You have this power coming out of your radio into this antenna of yours. There's a balloon of energy. The balloon of energy can be manipulated such that you can squeeze the power, squeeze the air, such that it goes in one direction you want it to go. So you still have, only have this amount of power, which we refer to as a zero dBi reference, isotopic reference. And then more gain in a specific direction means it is powerful in that direction. But remember that the energy that goes in that direction is taken away from somewhere else. So you just massaging all the um, directivity or the power in that direction. Efficiency is the other one that's involved there because antenna will be lossy. Materials are lossy. Um, you may have radon losses, you may have dielectric losses. Physically, this material that would kind of absorb energy, very low level, so it's not like it's going to get warm if it's low power, but energy is going somewhere and it just gets lost. Um, if it's high power though, that would be a big problem. So if you look at the 50 kilowatt kind of radio and you have losses, that's gonna be really bad. So you will see these broadcast kind of antennas that is really big, big systems. They will actually have very specific materials that they need to use that can absorb and take power into account, but also need to be super, super efficient and not lose power as, as well, try to avoid losing power. Just, there you go, that's it. VSWR, voltage standing wave ratio. Now, there's a lot of stuff here that, that can be related to that, and these are terms that you use. You need to be careful, and I'm actually, um, having spoken to um, Christoph as well, I, I know that there's, there's an in interesting one here. So, S parameters, return loss, impedance matching, resonance, those are all concepts that relate to VSWR. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing, but it's all relating to the ability of an antenna to just Take the power that it gets. So radio comes in. Oh, I'll add it on this side. Radio can sends energy out. It, antenna takes the energy, sends it on. If it doesn't take it all, it actually gets reflected back. A part of that gets reflected back is a problem. And there's a, a number that we say, well, this is acceptable or this is good enough. So VSWR often is um, two to one in the academic world, uh, more in, in the military world and an industrial world. We often say 1.5 to one. So Roughly 10% of the power actually can be reflected back if you say VSWR is 2 to 1. Um, now, return loss, there is an interesting one. I, I hope I'm not messing it up in this presentation. So just ask um, the lecturer afterwards if I mess this up or not. Return loss means a negative. You're already saying it by saying loss. So if you say return loss, remember to say 10 dB because you're saying referring it as loss. If you say the um, reflection coefficient, you can say minus 10 dB. So the negative shows you there is actually a loss involved. Um, so that's important to know. And, and as I say, VSWR, if you look at data sheets, minus, uh, it's 1.5 to 1. And it's basically how to explain VSWR in a way that is not too overly technical. You go to a pond of water. Do you have a bit of ripple? If it hits, a wall, like on a swimming pool. There's actually a reflection coming back. So everything is coming and it's going to come back as well. But then you need to take a snapshot and look at one point at time. You'll see there's actually a wave. Um, incoming is like this. So if you look at a point in time, it just goes like this and this and this. There's reflection going so and coming back. And because of the wave coming through and coming back, this is going to be higher. That ratio is voltage, a standing wave. That standing wave ratio is how much between what it could be and what it is going to be gives you that number. So that's just kind of in physics world where that, that kind of approach comes from. Path loss, and relating to path loss, you have Fritz equation, transmit power, receive sensitivity, losses, diffraction, reflections. Those are all numbers and words that are just being thrown at you. Um, taking it one little step back, just simplifying it to really something simple. Path loss is, if you look at I'm sending a certain amount of power, he's receiving a, only a fraction of what is being sent. That is path loss. So how much am I losing in my power from A 
to be. That's really all it is. Why are you losing power? Um, that can be very complicated, but it should be a fairly simple explanation. Because you are actually transmitting, the moment you throw a rock into water, it just all circles out. As you circle it out, that one bump of water, that effect over there is quite intense. But then as it circles out, that same effect has caused that ring. That same effect then later has caused that ring as it goes out. So, but your receiver is still this big. So if you were able to receive it here, bump and you get it, wow, that's a lot. But then a bit further, bump and then all that energy distribution is being um, that spread over that wave, over that bigger radius. So you receiving it here, it's a much lower proportion of the power that's available when this thing got, got dumped in. So that's in a 2D world with a water explanation. It's even worse in 3D because in 3D, that's what antenna does. It's you transmit here, everything happens in 3D world. So that power, that one watt of power that you have here, that you're being sent, that you send out, gets thrown out bigger and bigger and bigger. But the power is still one watt. So suddenly that's where you get that in integration of mass that you have to learn. So one bit of power, one watt of power, then here over oh, this whole bowl, the sum of everything in this whole bowl is one watt, but you still only receive this little bit. So that's the losses. It's not necessarily gone going away. It's just being spread over so much of a bigger distance that there's not much left for you to detect. And that's really what happens. Of course, there are genuine losses as well. You get losses in the air, you know, atmospheric losses and so forth. So there's genuine power just getting lost. It's gone forever. However, if you had an ability to detect all the power over this whole sphere, you would get that one watt back. But you got. Um, now, okay, so two other things that is more, going with more detail, the polarization. Uh, just throw in here linear, circular, vertical, horizontal, slant 45. Just go back to TV antennas. Again, old school TV antennas, you look at the stuff that's on the, on the roof, they are either aligned horizontally or vertically. Because the antenna on Mount Lofty on the tower is also vertically or horizontally. So you want this one, the way that it transmits and the E-fields and everything, a propagation to be a certain polarization, this one needs to match that. One day, when they match, you get the best energy transfer from A to B. If they're cross pole, in theory, you won't get any energy because this thing is coming in like this and this antenna is looking for polarization and horizontal pole. That's, that's a trick. We use that in our antenna theory. And the MIMA, multiple input, multiple output in 4G world, actually uses two poles, plus and minus 45, which I have there a slant 45 on the slide. Slant 45 shows you can actually use two channels to make uh, a transmission from A to B, and you have double the capacity available to use. And then reciprocity. Now, this is a tricky one, but it's quite a handy one at times. Passive devices have this rule of reciprocity. So I keep talking about how I am receiving it, and when you look at an antenna analysis and you see the radiation pattern, you just think about how it transmits. With a passive device, the beauty of the physics is it's actually the same when you receive the theory of reciprocity. So it just helps to remember this when you do antenna studies and you think about these things. Active devices, because you are introducing or pumping in power, it's a different um, kettle of fish and it could be all totally different. That might be a problem. All right. Um, we'll go to a quick example there. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know we have limited time available for well, what would have been the original lecture, but I just want to put that in there. So as far as the design, we use a tool called CST, Computer Simulation Tool. Um, and we will just show you through a few steps how we actually got using all these design parameters or antenna features to make a fancy antenna. First of all, a dipole, that's your most basic element, but it's one that's probably the most important because if you look at so many types of antennas, the building block can be reverted back to what the dipole is. So this is almost the single most important element that exists for me. A dipole, just two poles, half wavelength. The whole thing is half wavelength. It creates a radiation pattern that looks a bit like a, di a donut. So it doesn't have much going to the top and to the bottom and it just has this nice radiation pattern around. It's about 2 dB gain. So if it was 
100% sphere, it will be zero dBi. Now we squash the top and the bottom, squeeze out a little bit at the ends, and there it is about 2 dB antenna gain. You can see the resonance there, 2.4, so I just basically made a little dot ball for Wi-Fi. That's what you do. If you look at the field distribution, you'll see that basically it's just omni. So if you look from the top, so basically there's the antenna, you look from the top, it just rings out everywhere. That's what it does on the top view. The side view, not as clear in this view, but that's basically what it is. So you look from the side, you'll see just it circles out this way and it circles out that way. All good. Now, what you do to turn this into an antenna, we call a Yagi Uri antenna. Now, Yagi antennas has been, um, I think it's 1926, so really a classic antenna. But that's what makes it beautiful. It's classic and it works well. And it's still working great. Gets used in so many applications. Principle is super simple. You have your dipole and you put a reflector at the back. The length of the reflector and the distance from the actual antenna is important because that's what makes the antenna behave differently and you can actually use that to your advantage. What I have on the screen is there, basically I put a reflector next to the antenna and suddenly it goes and becomes a directional antenna. Directional meaning rather than sending it everywhere, it now goes in one direction. If I go back to that helicopter example, an omni is what you would need because a helicopter keeps moving around as it's flying. So you want it to always have coverage to the ground and somewhere around you need an omni. When you say, I want a stronger signal, what you do is you manipulate that radiation pattern bubble into one direction. Stuff like having a director and one, uh, the reflector behind it. And you can see the difference between the previous one, which was circling all around. This one is now forcing it in one direction. As you can see, the fields are completely different. There's more you can do. You can add a director in front. So now you have your original antenna. You have a reflector at the back and a little director in front and you squeeze all the energy in one direction, further increasing the gain of the antenna in that direction, but will be much weaker behind it. Um, just more intense in one direction. Now that's what you have. You have a little antenna, type pole, you have element in front, element at the back. What you would do often is basically say, okay, what can we do with this? You can take it further and put it in front of a dish. Why would you do that? Well, because a dish has even higher gain, because then you really go full on and you just blast power into one specific direction. But you do need a little directional antenna, so you can say, I'm focusing all my energy into this big dish, and then the big dish will say, okay, I'm now working hard. And see, it all starts with a very simple little antenna principle. Um, I have an ex example on the screen there, which basically is that little, little, antenna that I just build up quickly from a dart pole with a little reflector and a little director, put it in front of a bigger dish, and suddenly things change to that. Now this radiation pattern which is always just saying my power is going around, then my power is going a little bit more in one direction, and then a little bit more in one direction, put this thing in front of a dish, and suddenly as it is, I have something that is to 20, almost 27 dB gain. That's a lot, that's a heck of a lot. So really you can make a significant push in a specific direction using that additional modification of the original little dipole antenna. Um, I just wanted to convert this in the example further. So now we have a big dish with a dipole and a reflector in front. So okay, but let's cut the dish in half and turn it to up, upward direction, because you don't always have the luxury of having a big dish and antenna right in the middle. And I'm thinking about TV antennas in specific, where you always see things are a little bit offset. What does it do? You cut the antenna in half. This is just one way to see this. There's, there's, a, there's a more refined way to design offset reflectors, but this is just a kind of a poor man's way to, to get to the same type of approach. So I took the original dish, I just cut it in half, and now, because I don't want to reflect everything into this bottom half, I just say, okay, let's turn this up a little bit into that what's remaining of my antenna. Still works. Kind of works okay. Um, it's not as good as now 22 dB I gain. But what I do, I have this half dish. and say, well, let's just make a cut out. So we make a nice round dish. So that it becomes like that TV antenna there. So now what I have left, I just make it a circle. So it becomes a nice functional antenna that looks refined and proper 
and the variation pattern is a fairly decent 17.5 TBI gain. Um, as I said, this is just presentation for an example, so it's not going to say this is a full-on um, super professional presentation, but it is definitely a way to do this, and it shows you from starting with a little dart ball, adding the bits and pieces, which we would have talked through with all the internal principles, putting it in front of a dish, manipulating the dish a little bit, and you end up with a decent antenna that can do something really awesome for you, much more than what the original dive dartboard could ever have hoped to achieve. Um, that's that on my presentation. So, all right, cool, I'm happy with that. Now, what I want to do, because I actually, I did mention, this is what I wanted to do in class, if I was in class, is show you something about this. Now, what this is, is, um, it's a bit of a hobby, and I'm going to put more of these on our website for 2.4 gig, but this was for IoT 900 megahertz. It's basically the original antenna. Uh, you see, yeah, you can see this. This is the original antenna, is just a dart ball. The same in terms of antenna, this one is for 900 megahertz, and then adding the same principle. So, what you have there is that putting that there having a reflector and directors in front. There's a video I want to show you on YouTube and I have, have a few things there. So without me going further on about this, let me show you what I've done when I was out in the field. Go to this one and Who needs a high gain antenna? Keep it simple, keep it real. Now this could be a rhetorical question or hypothetical question, but actually it's quite an important one and it's not just helium. This question relates to any type of application because you always see this debate online about low gain, high gain. And this morning I actually got a question, someone said, but your 3 dBi antenna is more expensive than a 6 dBi. Why? Uh, gain doesn't necessarily mean better, it means more specific for a specific application. And in this case, today I'm gonna to just do a demonstration of a um, Helium IoT uh, quick upgrade of an Omni antenna to turn it from a dipole into a 9 dBi Yagi antenna. But the principle that I want to illustrate going forward is also high gain is a feature, it's not an upgrade. That's the most important thing for me. Now this of course applies to Wi-Fi, 4G, 5G, and it also applies to, there goes my antenna. It also applies to, um, any, any application that you have, and today, more so, it applies to helium. So I just want to quickly pause this video. I was outside outdoors when I was shooting the actual video itself, and there's obviously a lot of stuff going through my head as I present the um, concept. The thing what I'm doing here is a university lecture tutorial that I kind of demonstrated and wanted to, to prove here. So it's, it's kind of an antenna modification such as this. Um, in my title, I say you can get up to 11 dB improvement, which is correct, but there are certain conditions for that. So watch through the whole video, see at the end how I come to that number, and also the um, actual way that you can apply the same logic for yourself. So what I'm showing here is not just something that somebody in, in, a, in a wacky car parked it, but it's actually something that really got you an actual result that you can also have significant better directional antenna instead of a typical um, stock Omni antenna. Keep watching till the end and you'll see what's going on. What we work through is the actual radiation pattern and the plot. So on the screen, I'm now going to throw the um, actual waves of what you originally have. So when you have an Omni antenna, as we all know, I guess, um, it just basically transmits or sends the signal in all directions. You, you, you assume in a good antenna, it goes everywhere. Now, what we do when we convert it to a directional antenna, you take the wave that goes everywhere and you just let it flow in one specific direction. That's what we manipulate, that's what we can control as antenna designers. Um, you may see three-dimensional plots on data sheets. I have it on the screen. The problem with 3D plots, if you look at it on a two-dimensional print, which you can do because that's a piece of paper, if you don't see it, you struggle to visualize it. I'm showing there what we call azimuth and elevation. Azimuth means looking from the top, so you can see how it radiates all around, or when you look at it from the side, how it just basically has this bubble effect in all directions. Conversely, the antenna that we're going to create 
Alternatively, it's directional, so you push all the energy in one forward direction, both if you look from the side or from the top. Um, the easier way to explain this is on the 2D plot. This is the Omni, which is a circle in all directions or directional in one direction. If you look at it from the side as well, it's a bubble in both directions or basically pushes everything into one side. Now, that's really it. But again, I, I just go back to this, the um, actual waves, which I think for video purposes is probably the simplest way to explain what I'm about to do to a stock helium antenna using nothing but paper, pieces of metal, and some glue. Um, what I'm going to do, this is this kind of this is the first of many videos. This one is just to say this is possible, and I will prove this was my test setup. But on subsequent videos, I'll do the helium now to say there's a template, which I'll put on our website that you can download and just follow the instructions. And you can also convert the, um, your stock antenna to a highly directional antenna while you wait potentially for another one. Or you could um, potentially use this if you want to have a test setup for something. Um, subsequently, I'm going to do the same for 4G and 5G, first Australia, then also US. And if there's any interest from, the, from Europe as well in specific bands, I will do that as well. The thing is, these antennas would be frequency um, selective. So they won't, this one won't work in a 4G frequency as well. It might a little bit, but it's not really designed for that. And then of course Wi-Fi is a big one because you can do the same thing on Wi-Fi. It's going to be much smaller, so probably much more elegant and easier to use. What I have here is my test setup. I have a VNA, which is a vector network analyzer, the blue box here. Um, it's from MagicQ, a company in the Netherlands. Um, I'm going to do some demos on that um, setup as well soon enough, but this is kind of a, I'd say a poor man's test of an antenna setup, and it kind of works, works quite well, but there is an issue, and I can show you the issues as well, but we can work through that. Um, so the vector network analyzer is sending a signal from one port to one antenna, then, it transmits everywhere. The other antenna picks it up and sends it back to the VNA. What we have on the computer screen is basically the effect of that that loop. So again, I was outside and, and I was trying to demonstrate. I still am trying to demonstrate you have two antennas and you're trying to communicate between the two, but I refer to S21. Now S21, if you look at um, typical in helium in this case, the example would be um, like, like you have path loss and you say, well, the RSSI at the other point is minus 110 or minus 120 dBm. What actually that number is that I say, that I refer to and that I demonstrate in the video itself is something like, let's say, minus 40, minus 30. Basically, in an un, um, not calculated, uncalibrated way, it is just giving you a reference to say from antenna A, let's say there's antenna A, to antenna B, Without any calibration, without anything done, there seems to be a loss of that 40 dB of power, of signal. And it's a relative measurement. When you calibrate it, you can actually say, okay, well, the level should be there, it should be there. What you see through the frequencies, that is always going to be the same. Well, the effect that antenna would have that you change will then be the same over the whole thing. But the offset, like if it's... Um, the cables are bad or the distances are longer or shorter between each other, they will all have uh, a significant impact on the level of the whole signal. But S21 is just a power transfer number. So it says, it gives you an indication and an understanding that over that frequency that I'm looking at, how much power am I transferring from this point to that point? And it's just a relative number. So once you have the screen with the number, that's what you say, well, this is what I know I have. And then you start to change stuff and you will see things move up and down. Continue with the video. See, if I move around, like now, you'll see the, um, the wave, the results are actually you know, jumpy. It, it goes all over the place because mainly this antenna is an Omni and I'm uh, outdoors. Uh, there's a lot of reflections from the gate on that side, which you can't see the building on this side, which you huh, also can't see. We have the vehicle at the back. Um, and everything is having an effect. That's why you need an anechoic chamber, an a chamber that basically absorbs all the reflections. When you do the measurement, people also go out of the chamber so that you don't have the effect of anything else than your antenna talking to the other antenna and you can measure in a nice clean environment what's going on. You remove all reflections. Today, this is what we have, this is what we're going to use. First thing that I found really interesting um, as I was building the setup, but I just want to show you this before I do the actual demonstration of the, um, the concept is, you see it, it is quite bumpy, so it, um, it goes up and down, up and down over frequency. If I move this around, 
um, I'll just move it up and down, you actually see how that, that wave moves. It's almost like linear, and that's exactly the problem. So, as a good salesman, I'll put my marker, which is in the middle at 9.15, right on the dip. Why? Just because that's where it looks at its weakest, and I get probably reflections from the back. When I put a directional antenna on, we're waiting for the bus there. When I put a directional antenna on, it's going to mainly focus on that antenna. Any reflections that I could have had from the back will have a lot, much less of an impact. So, as a good salesperson, what an antenna company would do is that kind of thing, where they look at that, say, oh man, just look at that. This is the weakest. When I modify that, it's going to look so much better. Um, I might as well do that, because that's cool. But you can see, if I move it, I just move it a little bit, and it's just smooth as it moves through. And this is the kind of effect that I... Um, that you need to monitor and assess, and something you can't do if you don't have a VNA in your antenna setup. So high gain directional has its, its obvious advantages, not so much just for the forward gain, but also the fact that it's actually eliminating reflections from the back. So I just want to stop on this actual plot here and just put it on the screen again. The, um, what you see is that ripple effect that I go through, and I'm obviously very excited when I shoot the video, and I still am, that the fact is when you move the antenna around, you actually see that ripple um, it's like a snake almost going through the actual frequency, um, the relative frequency positions. Now, the ripple itself is a significant problem. Um, and I, I just want to stand still on that, that point as well. The ripple is because of the reflections that you could see in a, in a non-ideal environment. Real life is a non-ideal environment. So everywhere you go, that's the kind of thing that you will, you will see. You know, you remember when you, or not remember, you might know that when you walk around, your phone might fade, like go weaker and stronger. Not so much these days, the phones are better, but, but like in the old days or so, you would have had this fading effect that you might experience. Um, the only way to get around this, if you do an antenna measurement like what we do there, or I did there, is basically to go into an anechoic chamber. So put put sort of absorber around it, or to go r really remote and rural that yeah, there's nothing that can reflect. Um, as a user, an antenna installer, and this is now relevant for helium as much as it is for 4G and well, if you had the luxury of Wi-Fi to do this, it probably is not practical, but go high. So you get your antenna away from obstructions. You get your antenna away from stuff that's going to cause trouble um, over the trees, away from the gate, away from the house, away from the walls, away from the glass, all that stuff. Well, this effect that you see is really the effect. Um, it's just that's the, a, a nice visual way to demonstrate the effect that, that um, reflections will have. It also ties into a video I've done last year, late last year, about reflections. Um, that's an extreme example where you don't want to put an antenna against a metal pole. It's an extreme example, but it's the same principle again, that that's the kind of thing that happens, is these reflections in, in, in phase, out of phase, will cause that ripple. What is also interesting, and now I'm just going on a tangent that's probably not useful enough, but the positive side is also potentially higher than what actually can be expected, because you would have constructive and destructive interference. So. There's a lot of stuff happening in that plot, so much more than what I could actually afford to say in here, and I've probably already said it much, so let's carry on. This antenna that I have on me, the one that I created, the one that I will make in future designs, it converts my dipole into a Yagi. I have a reflector, I have room for my actual radiator, my element, and I have the directors in front. This is what we design using CST. In using CST, we could calculate this and we can work it out, and then we just I put it on a piece of paper. Those metal rods that I use can be kind of anything. I used um, spare or scrap uh, cable, but you could use pieces of wire or anything from home. So this is a piece of cotton. This is obviously my printed design that I put on there. I put the measurements on there that you can then use for yourself um, and just work it out, put it where I tell you to put it because I have the markings on there. And there is two slots. Now the two slots I will explain in the um, next video, but I'm not outside because with the wind blowing, it's quite hard to actually get it to work properly. I'm just going to put it in position against the antenna. So as I say, this is what's going to happen. There's the antenna. I'm going to just put it that the dart pole is there so that all the spacing is correct. See what happens. Put it against it, just like I converted to a doggy. There we go. And gone. Take it away. Put it back. Take it away. Huge effect. Now, if I move the position, this is where the reflections are really causing trouble. You can move it this way. It's my worst. It's my worst. Again, whatever I do, 
I smooth it out and I gain as much as I want, as much as I need. Now, because it's outdoors, it's not always going to be smooth, but you get the effect. This is what it does. And you can do the same on yourself, for yourself. Anyway, so if I move away, ah, man, this thing fell over. I'm also having a huge impact. So really, I do want to actually put a rubber band on there. There we go. That's the effect. That's all I could say. Works like a dream. Pretty happy with that. Okay, now I've, I've presented the results and I kind of just pointed and waved at the results and really excited about, look at this, this is happening, it's making such a big difference and it's such an improvement and I have this antenna on my hand, which is the one here with me. Um, I just want to stand still by it again and just say, you should really look at it with um, almost with a fine tooth comb because the scales on the plot, the, the Magic Q device that I have, is the, the scale is what it is. So you don't get an appreciation for how much that actually um, jumps. So I just have the slide that I put on the screen now to just have it as a static image to say, hang on, look at this. Because what you would normally do, if, if I was writing an engineering report and I was actually trying to highlight this effect, I wouldn't use the scale that, that that's available on the machine itself. I wouldn't go from, um, no, zero to minus 50 or plus 10 to minus 50 because then the actual impact that you're seeing is not highlighted enough. Um, so on the screen you'll see that of course I positioned it such as in the middle of a dip. That is could feel like a bit of trickery but it actually was genuinely there to show that this is how bad things could be and then the improvement the plot on the right the after is real because once you eliminate reflections from the back because the antenna no longer is really sensitive towards what's happening at the back it's just really focused on going forward which is kind of uh, directional antenna 101 just there um, so the plot on the right is theoretically man that's what i want that's what you need and this is the antenna that you will get or the type of thing that you will get the plot on the left is what Kind of, I'll try to break it as bad as I can because in the same broken, broken position, you have the antenna, you have the antenna before, like kind of just a, like that almost, and then after. It's the same antenna. In a, if you put it in the right place, that's the kind of effect. That's the kind of improvement that you get. So I just wanted to stand still on that fact and make sure that it really um, kind of. You know, that you absorb it in, the, the improvement that this kind of impact can have. And of course, go to our website and um, you can download this template for Helium and there's more templates that will come for Helium for Europe and um, 4G and Wi-Fi as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll make more build videos. Um, there's gonna be a build video for the Helium ones soon. Um, and we'll, we'll do build videos as well for the other ones. But um, anyway, let's continue with the video. And just put a rubber band on and we'll see what it does. I'll put this at the back so that my, um, I don't have my hands actually interfering. Oh yeah, rubber band is on, antenna's in position, Yagi's up, wind is blowing it over. Uh, that's how I get it there. There you go, my Yagi's up. Let's look at the result. There we go. That's that. There we go. That's why I go inside to do the rest of the video. Another thing, because now it's there, but my hand is somewhat in the way, just to show the directionality. I turn this away, if the wind actually allows me to turn it away. This is it. That's how low it goes. Um, considering there's reflections and the wind is constantly blowing. Um, one thing here, that I do want to note while it's still rolling and I in, unintentionally is still doing, doing a recording. Um, this is obviously an experimental antenna. It's an indoor antenna. It's something you could use to see is my antenna going to benefit from a high gain antenna. Um, it's not a permanent setup, but it's definitely for indoors. Before you spend money on buying a nine or eight or six dBi antenna, just try to see, is this gonna work? And potentially, I had an inquiry this morning from a customer who said, he's just getting a lot of interference from somewhere. He doesn't know where. And I said, well, you know what? You need to watch this video, build one of these antennas and um, test. Because what I've just done with a negative test by turning away, what it gives you is ability to see where is it working, where is it not working. And where it's not working, you can kind of just deduce, deduce the duct, figure out where your problems are, and then 
invest in an expensive antenna once you got your head around this. So let's try again. Thanks for watching. <laughs> See you in the next video. Bye bye. Well, thanks a lot for watching through that whole video. So I guess fundamentally, knowing your antenna principles and everything that you learn can make a huge difference as you see in that video. 11 dB better antenna gain in the forward direction. Also because we're actually helping to eliminate some of the problems behind us. So that's really all I could say about that. Thanks for yeah, listening through this lecture. I hope I um, inspired a few of you to, to take this, this kind of subject matter further. And the rest of you, if you're out in the um, industry one day, remember antennas are awesome and they can be really useful for your advantage. Thanks for watching. I'm just going to try and switch to the um, closing scene just because I um, <laughs> really want to do this properly. Let's see that. Cheers, guys.